Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. I think we are finally live. Good to go. So I think everyone's starting to enter the room and get settled. So as you do that, want to start welcoming our guests. Thank you all so much for joining us. Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. I see everyone starting to enter the room. I see the participant numbers starting to go up. I know we're on Facebook Live right now. So thank you all so much for joining us. Truly appreciate it. On behalf of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Omega Eta Zeta Chapter, my name is Alicia Queen. I'm the president of our chapter, proudly serving Quincy Mass and the South Shore of Massachusetts and just want to welcome you all to this space this evening. I am truly excited to share with you all this amazing event. And without further ado, I'm gonna to present to you all Undished. <laughs> So thank you all this evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. For those of you that are in the space, in the room, you might be on Facebook Live. Please let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. Let us know if you're from a different organization, a different member of the Divine Nine. Uh, remember to keep your mics muted. Also, feel free to ask questions. That's what we're here for this evening, for us to gain knowledge and learn from each other. The goal is for us to stay on topic, stay on agenda, and get you here to learn and understand more about you, more about what you can do for yourself and your community to live healthier and live longer and stronger. But before we dive into this topic, as I stated before, you know, this is Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Omega Eta Zeta Chapter, and just wanted you all to understand where we are coming from. Our organization, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, was founded on January 16, 1920. So last year, we celebrated 100 years, our centennial year, by the five founders you see before you on this page. So we always start off every presentation, every event, paying homage to our founders that you see before you. In addition to that, because we are in this area, so proudly serving Massachusetts, we are part of the Atlantic region. But in addition, I just want to let you know that the woman you see before you is our international president. That is Valerie Hollingsworth Baker. After her is our Atlantic Regional Director, Gina Merritt Epps, and of course our Tri-State Director, Ms. Bridget Bostick. So I am so proud that the women that are coming before you decided to say yes, answer the call, and bring before you this discussion called Undished. We decided to kind of dive deep into this topic because Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated has an initiative with Z Hope where we are Zetas helping other people excel. And this evening, we wanna help you all excel. We want you to understand more about what you can do for yourself, for your um, mates, for your children, for your generations to come, how we can learn to start living better, living stronger and living healthier, especially when we don't have access to a lot of the foods that we really need to help us during this time. So this evening, um, not only am I the chapter president, but I'm also going to be serving as your moderator. So I would like to uh, present to you our panel, but just before that, um, just want to definitely give this quick disclaimer. Understand that by joining this presentation, this webinar, it's voluntary. <laughs> you know, and that this information does not qualify for a substitute for any medical advice without you going to your physician or your nutritionist, go get the help that you need, go get the information you need. This is part of that information, but you're gonna follow up, you're gonna do your due diligence. In addition, remember, when you get those next steps, take that advice in. Understand that Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated Omega Eta Zeta Chapter and our panelists that we see before you are serving this platform as a way to get the information out to you and that any adverse outcomes that may come as a result to attending this webinar, please don't hold us liable or responsible. We're just here to serve as a way for you to understand, get the information out there, and for you to do your due diligence and get those next steps. So by the end of this 
webinar, our goal is for you to identify healthy and affordable dietary practices. In addition, we want you to inform your community about veganism and healthy alternatives. Our goal is for you to educate one another on the possible ways to live a healthier lifestyle. And above all, make the necessary steps for you to transition to a better you. That's all we want to make sure that happens is that by the end of this session, you come out being a better version of you. So without further ado, remember the ground rules, let every voice be heard, respect other people's experiences, respect to agree to dis respectfully agree to disagree and if you're going to use a hypothetical make sure you don't pe use people's real names or real situations try to change up the facts just a little bit and maintain decorum place all those questions in the comments and chat box so we can touch base and make sure that we reach them at the end of the night Again, thank you to all attendees, all members of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated that are joining us, all members of the Divine Nine, all of our organizations, all friends and family. I want to present to you Undished. So now let me help you meet our panel. This evening, we have Bree, the fruit dealer. So Miss Brianna Groover is a social worker, a vegan, a certified yoga instructor, certified Zumba instructor, entrepreneur, urban gardener, dog mom, and she is from Freeport, Long Island, New York. In addition, Miss Bree's journey is into wellness began around 2017 when she transitioned into uh, that vegetarian and then gardening and also growing her own fruits and vegetables in her backyard. She also, again, pursued a yoga certification all after graduating with her master's in social work. So after upgrading from vegetarian to vegan, she began to talk to others about how important it was to just look at wellness overall from both a physical and mental aspect. So then she began making fruit bowls for herself and others at low cost and started really changing her family and her neighborhood. And that caught on like wildfire. So before long, Brie inherited the label, the fruit dealer, because she would then deliver those to people on jobs, schools, and then that became a full-fledged business. So guess what? It officially caught on and she became Brie, the fruit dealer. She then started offering salads, smoothies, press juices, immunity shots, juice detox challenges, and so much more. But Brie didn't stop there. She started changing the lives of youth ages six to 13 and created Brie Cares. So I introduce you all, Brie, the fruit dealer. Thank you In all so much. <laughs> Thank you, Brie. In addition, we have with us the dynamic duo, Namaste Vegan. So Era, Erin and Sharifa Reed are the founders of Namaste Vegan. They have been conscious eaters oops, sorry, Conscious Eaters and for almost two decades, and they took the leap, of the, the leap from vegetarianism to veganism four years ago. They decided to begin Namaste Vegan because their city in Suffolk County, New York, had a huge deficit with restaurants catering for exclusive vegan foods. So last August, they began with baked goods, mostly, you know, within those farmers markets areas and local um, areas so that they started at the pop-up events but guess what? They started branching out. So no longer do they do just bakeries, they've added the savory options as well. They are most known for their infamous tenderoni. That is their version of the vegan mac and cheese. And currently they're weighing their options to look at a brick and mortar or a food truck so that they can really start expanding those delectable dishes that they have on a further scale. With that, I introduce to you all Namaste Vegan. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, ladies. Thank you. And last but not least, we have the Waffle Chick. So the Waffle Chick was a creative idea that was birthed back in 2017 by Karen Davis, a local RN with a passion for cooking. After donating her talents and charity and talents to a charity event, Karen took her concept of preparing her favorite dishes you know, that chicken and waffles to small events uh, with friends. But then she saw that early success and said, you know what, let me turn this into a business. So the waffle chick, think waffle chic as fashionable and chicken and waffles, it then became 
all from that one brunch idea. And it's enticing people to start eating out of the box and eating outside of the box. Karen resides in New York with her husband and her son and holds a BBA in accounting from Pace University. And she has a bachelor's in science and nursing from NYU, as well as a nursing licensure and her CPA. And her nephew is also here as well. And he has an ecstatic amount to say as well. I just don't have them yet because I can't see them in my preview. But the two of them are also going to share a lot about the Waffle Chic. So with that, Karen, welcome to this event. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen right there because the floor is yours. And I need the public to understand exactly what it is that you know, they've tapped into what is veganism and how can people really start to, <laughs> I, I see y'all laughing, <laughs> but we're not laughing. I want to know like, what, what is it? How, how can people get into it? How can people start changing their lives and really understand why, why make this move? Well, you know, initially in 2017, when we said we were going to go vegan, we, we were dipping our toe in the water because we really had no understanding. We just figured if we weren't eating animal products, we were vegan. And through that journey and that process, we realized that anything that had to do with animals, we had to eliminate out of our lifestyle. From the sneakers we wear on our feet, you know, the, the coats we were wearing. And we slowly are making that transition to anything that we feel exploits animals, we removed it from our lifestyle. So for us, it's, it's a place of compassion. It's a place of love. It's not just a diet. It truly is a lifestyle. And, you know, we, we, definitely, we, we definitely try to encompass that holistically. Like the, the simple fact that you just said, you know, I wanna change what I'm putting in, in my body but that means I have to change what I'm putting on my body. Yeah. And that's, that's real. Cause I don't think that people fully understand that mindset of, you know, this is not just a one road stop. I've got to make a holistic approach when I decide I'm going to make this leap. And it wasn't just for us. Um, we have two daughters as well. So wow. the whole family, change and it wasn't a very big leap for them you know once you decide that if you're going to put healthy things into your body you can't you know not put those things into your children as well and give them the information and let them know you know what you're doing and why you're doing it as well now I have to ask you know even in, in, anyone can answer that question. And when you're deciding to kind of make this transition, I, I love that you're involving, you know, your 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 daughter from from young, because at least they're they're growing with that ideal from young. You know, I, I have a five year old personally, and you know, people say all the time, "Oh, well, what do you mean she eats fruits? What do you mean she eats vegetables?" Like she doesn't really eat junk food. But then I had to think to myself, I'm like, I don't really eat junk food. So it's like she picks up those, those habits because she sees what I do. Well, and that's just like food now. You know, when you're younger, you tend to cook the same foods that your parents made. And so all of the good things and the bad things, you're eating them still. <laughs> whether you feel that they're right or not, you know, you're so used to the taste of them. You think that that's, hey, that's what I'm supposed to eat. We inherit our, we inherit our eating habits, you know, and we eat what mommy cooked. I cook what mommy cooked and it becomes natural in that transition. And a lot of people see this, but this vegan lifestyle with the children, like it's child abuse. People use that term, like you shouldn't be. <laughs> but, you know, as far as we're concerned, there's no pressure, right? I always tell my children, make the best decision. I'm not watching you when you leave this house, what you're eating. I just hope that what we're doing in this home is enough for you to carry forward, exactly. But there's no pressure. And, you know, they want to, when they move out the house, <laughs> you know, they know not to bring that in the home. But we just hope that they're surrounded with these good decisions, you know, good decisions enough that 
they perpetuate that cycle moving forward. But there's definitely no pressure. There should be no pressure. There should be something that, and that there's no pressure as far as I'm concerned with them. This is something they're interested in because again, we have that holistic approach. We show them they're in the kitchen with us. You know, like we watch documentaries together, you know, like we're, we're perpetuating that enlightenment when it comes to this vegan lifestyle. So I have to ask Bree, cause I, I know you have a, a youth component to what you do. And, and I have to ask, are you seeing, you know, the youth with the parents or is it, you know, the youth bringing in their parents and bringing in their, the older crowd? Like, how does that work? To be honest, I see um, what I give the youth, they bring it home. So I don't really deal too much with like parents or like family members. I strictly deal with the youth as far as yoga or Zumba or like kids nutrition or things like that. And whatever I teach them, they get so excited and motivated that they bring it home to their family. So they're at home, like in the kitchen making smoothies or at home doing yoga or like doing things that like really, really excites me. And it really knows that like what I'm doing, I'm doing it for the right reasons, you know? So it really makes a huge difference. And it's so crazy to see how much they're really picking up what I'm putting down. So it's like really <laughs> amazing. I love that. And, and I have to ask like, Karen, so for you, did you, it's like why why the transition or like what what helped with the transition i guess and and i think that's what um a lot of us are seeing now is the trend is how do i make a transition if this is something one that i want to do and that i need to do because i think it's one thing when you have a desire to do it versus when you're desperate because your health is requiring you to do it. So I guess like that's a question for either one of you all. Like I know that like the documentaries kind of shook a lot of people into being like, that's what y'all are putting in my food. Oh, okay. I guess I um, need to make a change. And now it's the, I have no choice. Like I can't eat these things because I might not live in much longer. Like what actually helps people make the change? How do you gradually start making those steps? So for the most part, um, making a change in, in health, it's not just about being a vegan per se. It's just about an overall wellness. So when you educate yourself and when you tap into becoming a educated consumer, it leads to enlightenment. And so once enlightenment starts to take place, people tend to move away from things that they've discovered that, you know, it's really not, not, not something that the body needs. It's not something that the body can process. So once, so once you recognize that, then I think people start to make um, educated changes. And so one of that educated change leads to someone saying, oh, I'm not going to have animal products anymore for um, quote unquote health reasons or quote unquote just conscious um, things about animal cru cruelty and, and um, the likes of that. In general, I feel like just education, education plays a big role in how we move forward in just anything we do. And for the most part, food, the food we, 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 we intake, because the body is designed to break down particles and, and, and some of the things that are in the products, the body just can't process it. And so it, it leaves us to say, hey, we need to stop eating some of these things and not for quote unquote, it's not just all animal product that is bad for us. There are other things that's out there that is bad also. So I think just a general um, caveat would be, would be education. That's like the first thing that would, you know, prompt someone to want to have a healthier lifestyle and a healthier diet. I love that you mentioned the the education piece and like one of the questions we had is it seemed, you know, like we did some research and, you know, the BBC had mentioned that it's apparent that a lot of Black Americans seem to be three times likely 
um, to switch to a vegan or a vegetarian lifestyle than other Americans. And I'm, I'm curious if you see more of our community making that switch um, or being more apt to make the switch. And if so, is it because, you know, we are more adapt to grow our own foods or actually take the time to cultivate and cook our own foods and really dive deep and, and cultivate those recipes. Like I think about you, you know, making that, that change to mac and cheese and really understanding how to change soul food and make it food to the soul. And it, is it something that our community can really hold on to? So um, a big thing about change and, and soul food change, because, you know, as Black, as Black Americans, Black Caribbean, because I'm from the Caribbean, um, soul food was just something that we, we were raised on. And it wasn't because of um, it's something that we wanted to do. It was much more by choice yeah. because it was, it was more affordable. Like, you know, we couldn't really afford meat products to begin with, you know, so we probably sure. ate that like once a month, once a week. And then the other part of it is that we, we had a lot of greens, we had a lot of vegetables. And so we were we practically were raised on a vegetarian diet or, you know, quote unquote, without really knowing it. But then as we become mm. adults, like for my nephew, he's here, Karen, he could speak to um, the transition because he transitioned like, you know, the whole spectrum of transitioning into uh a vegan lifestyle where his family, I think he's probably the notorious one in the whole family, really that is a, um, quote, vegan. Cause even though I, for, for most of my life has been a healthy eater, a very um, aware consumer. And a lot of people think I'm weird. Cause I, you know, I really stop and read everything that I'm buying. And if it has more than like, five or ingredients that I can't pronounce. I don't want it. And, you know, so like my whole, my whole spectrum of cooking and eating is just based on health and wellness. So I'm going to bring Karen on and he could probably speak about, you know, that whole transition into how he made the transition and what, and cause he's, he's your guy next door. He's your guy next door that really just stays home and just comes up with these recipes and, and um, cooks and affordability and, and realistically, you know, like these things are realistic, these things that are affordable and reachable that, you can incorporate in your in your daily daily meals without you know breaking the bank and and go and I know we have questions about that too is like mm -hmm. of course the price as a as a uh, businesswoman incorporating a vegan menu and a vegan the vegan community in in my menu I have seen that it is much more expensive to really buy the product and buy wholesome product, not just anything that they're mm -hmm. selling out there is labeled vegan, because then when you read it, you're like, what are all these chemical things that they're putting in saying it's vegan? So um, Karen, if you wanna speak on yeah. that and jump in and just you know speak to like transitioning. I'm happy to, hey everyone. Um, so this week, today is Thursday. I live in Atlanta. And this week I went to the grocery store and I, I buy most of my food at a place called Sprouts. Um, and I spent $57 on groceries. And I cooked. <laughs> uh, on Friday, I made, I'm not sure if you've seen the, the viral TikTok video of the feta cheese. Uh, so I made that with tofu and um, what else? And cashew. And then I made butternut squash soup. I made red beans and rice. Um, I made some mushroom tacos and, you know, for me, all of that was $57. So I, so I speak then on sort of affordability, right? So there are ways in which if we talk about, um, I agree with, with Karen on, I think sometimes people, there, there is a perception and there is a reality that buying certain kinds of food is a bit more pricier, but it is also affordable, right? So we talk about beans, black beans, red beans, pinto beans. We talk about mushrooms. We talk about vegetables. Um, my mother has been cooking all week the 
the hot dog carrots, you know, and so, so they're, they're and again, if you eat hot, if you eat, if you eat hot dogs anyhow, you're basically eating nothing, right? So you can eat some hot dog carrots, and and then this week I made uh, chickpea tuna, right? And we put celery and we put salt and pepper and we put right. So you can you can do all of that in a week, and that's about fifty seven to sixty dollars. I would say though that for me, when I talk about veganism, sort of a number of things come to mind. And I, I often hesitate to say that word because you're either considered white or weird. Mm. And it's like it's a very white thing or it's a very weird thing or you're odd or you're difficult. <laughs> you know, so those are some of the, the challenges that I think particularly as black folks who are talking about being plant-based. But I do think it's critical to talk about capitalism. It's, it's critical to talk about consumerism and it's critical to talk about the climate catastrophe. So for me, my entree into veganism or plant-based living was a reality that our planet is suffering and dying and that the farming of meat and animals is perhaps the most critical thing that's hastening our climate catastrophe. And as individuals, um, either not eating animal products or reducing how much animals we eat, it is the data tells us it is the single most meaningful thing individuals can do to slow um, the disaster that is happening to our planet. So that was sort of my entree. And it is, it, it is an affront to, and it is a political commitment, right? That I want to be a steward of earth and the environment and environment here is not the whales and the dogs and the fish, but the people, particularly black people. I think it's also critical to know that, you know, Karen talked about African and Caribbean cultures, like plant and plant-based living is, is really part of who we are, right? Like a lot of, you know, I'm, we grew up in Jamaica and we didn't have a lot of money. So meat and particularly the stuff that's hard to give up wasn't really part of our diet. You know, we ate chicken back and liver and kidney, uh, you know, and oxtail, which is a really good Jamaican staple was like a feature. And we did that every now and again, but that wasn't an everyday thing. And most of our diet did in fact include plant and plant-based food. So, you know, and the transition, I struggled with the idea of going home and being the only person at Thanksgiving, like not eating curry goat and not, right. So, so the transition was, was, was a cultural one. Like I had to wrestle with what does it mean? And, and when I went home, I did eat some curry goat I, because there was, there was a way in which I was just like, I'm not gonna be the only Negro who was like, don't give me the goat, right? But over time, I've watched my family sort of make choices aligned with what I'm doing. Um, in ways that are supportive because, you know, we're people who read and think and we're like, hey, this is not as bad as we thought it was. And so people are slowly making that transition to more plants, less animal. And yeah, I kind of want to um, piggyback on that as well, because um, I grew up, my family's Jamaican. Um, my mother would, I guess, identify more as like a Rasta. So that was no big deal, right? I was 14 years old when I decided to relinquish all meat. And, you know, not necessarily all animal products, but it was like no big deal because my mother cooked, you know, like llama bean stew and, you know, like rice and peas. Like I was good with the sides, you know, <laughs> like, and that's no big deal. And kind of go back to your question, why are people of color more likely to accept and adopt this vegan and vegetarian lifestyle? It's because it's who we are. You know, like we grow up eating these provisions and fruits and vegetables, and it's it's inside of us. You know, like all melanated people, when you go to India, the spice capital, those people, you know, they primarily eat fruits and vegetables. It's who we are, and we share that across the seas, the oceans. It doesn't matter where we are. It's who we are because it's something that's innate. And that's why it's no big deal for us people of color to say, you know, I can get behind that. I can eat like this, you know, because it's who we are. You know, I know I keep saying it, but it's really like you can't change with that. Some, that's something that's so deep inside of you. It's, it's who we are. So it's no big deal for us, pe us people of color to say, you know what, we're going to be more vegetarian, more vegan and eat the things that we already were eating before they got a name or a trend or something like that. So, yeah, this is like business as usual for us. Right. It feels like home. I just wanted to add, like, when it comes to your food, it, for me, when I cook, when I cook for the family, when I cook for the business, anything I see, I turn to vegan. 
and you can do that when you cook when you use all these different spices and blends of what whatever it is you can turn it vegan you know they have these um this whole thing on facebook i saw for um seitan you know some people eat it some people don't but you can make it anything you want you know we have tacos we have you know whatever you name you know i scroll on instagram or i'll look up recipes on different things and get ideas but whatever it is as long as you put some seasoning with it you yeah. will be okay <laughs> put a little ancestors on it you get it together i promise you yeah. as long as you you know you feel um the need to eat you're going to get in that kitchen and you're going to cook and you're going to put in it what you feel is going to make it taste the best. And if it, if you mess it up the first time, Reach you know, up. just try it again. And when it comes to like the um, shopping, when it comes to vegetables and, you know, especially in this time, you want to, the what I do is I go to the grocery store every other day. I do not want my vegetables going bad. I know that a lot of people don't have the time to do that, but because I want to make sure that I'm not wasting food, I definitely, you know, I pick up what I need. And if I know that I'm making something else the next day, I'll pick that up too. But I def I want my, my food fresh. You know, you can't, I don't like to waste. <laughs> to say I don't like to waste food. I mean, I, I truly believe in that and just like understanding that the culture, understanding, you know, finding a flavor and finding a profile that works for you because like my family's West Indian, my mother's from Barbados and we make rotis and everything from scratch. So like I'm that person, we've had people come and she's like, they're like, oh yeah, I need a roti, but she's like, I need it with vegetarian. And they're like, okay. So my mother learned how to make some vegetarian rotis real quick. She's got her chickpeas, potatoes, curry, cumin, and got it together. And I was like, I'll eat the vegetarian roti. And I'm just so used because I don't really eat a lot of meat. And mm -hmm. as a child, I didn't either. So for me, I was like, well, this tastes better than the other one. So I understand it. I get it. And I feel like everybody is so scared of the word, but they're... It's like, if you just tap in, you'd understand. And I, I like, I wonder sometimes, you know, what pushback you all have seen in terms of like your community. And, and I think Karen, even you, you tapped into it, you know, going back home and your family being like, you don't eat what? You don't do what? What you mean you don't eat meat no more? What you mean you don't, you know, eat chicken wings? I, I... Oh, to touch on that, we, um, we have family members, you know, they do a Thanksgiving and first thing I said is like, Hey, you want us to come? We have to be able to yeah. um, cook as well. You know, if we're going to come. So we made a full Thanksgiving, a vegan Thanksgiving and my other side of the family, they had, you know, the things that they wanted to eat. And of course they want to come and eat all the vegan stuff because <laughs> You know, they want to try it. And of course it's good, but you know, you just, when you go visit, you want to, for us, you know, mm -hmm. and I would try it, just set the standard for yourself to say like, listen, I'm not eating that. If, if it's okay with you, you know, you know, I'm coming, can I get in your kitchen and, you know, whip something up just to make sure that you don't have to sacrifice based on what mm -hmm. someone else doesn't agree with. Mm -hmm. I, I would also add, though, even for me, and again, I've had a number of these experiences with my own family where I think a lot of times, um, and I'm 38 now, so I can reflect on this, we build up a lot of notions about what people will or will not resist. And for me, again, because the way I am living is, is also about activism I, I am less interested actually in drawing this line of dichotomy of I'm over here, you're over there. I am really interested in how inviting people to participate in what it is I am doing, right? Because for me, if, and again, because my, my entree is around the environment and the climate catastrophe, if, if there are, if I stay, this is, you know, I grew up in the church, so there's a, there, there is a, 
there is a inkling or a, a sort of draw a sort of personal piety, right? I am good. I don't eat meat. I am clean. Everybody else is not. Mm -hmm. And we can feel good about that. But in reality, it is insufficient if we're not changing culture and changing public policy and making these things more accessible, right? So if I'm the only vegan on my block, that has no buying power. It has no economic power. Like I'm going to feel good which is why I appreciate what Karen is doing because a part of what we, we also have to do is push businesses to make different kinds of choices and make other things available. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, when, when the varieties of food that we have are more than just lettuce and tomato, and you can go into the grocery store and go to the waffle chicken, go to the pop-up place and find good food, People will eat food that is good because it is good. And so a part of my work is also to say, how do we expand the possibilities and the choices that people have, not just to have a line where I'm like, I'm not crossing this and you can stay over there. When I go to meetings and conferences, I don't just ask about what am I going to eat? I say, hey, I found this place that offers really good food that everybody can participate in. Would you consider offering this, not just for me, because then they're going to have a little Quran section. And I'm, I'm Black, I'm queer, I'm immigrant, I'm, you know, I don't go to church, like I'm all these things already. And so I'm like, I don't want another label that's going to marginalize me. So I'm like, I'm just trying to be in the group. Because I think sometimes we can get really hung up on, I'm over here. And then every, and it's, for me, that, that doesn't work because I live at the margins. Everything about me is marginal. I have an accent. I am, you know, I'm a recent citizen, but I'm an immigrant. And so if I'm always carving out my little piece of the world, mm -hmm. then it, it's not making the kind of political impact we want to have. So we have to, you know, say to our families, hey, what that's what I'm doing. Hey, I can cook this thing and share it with you. You know, that's how Karen, I, I sent. I think I was sending something to Karen. I was like, hey, you know, you could do this thing with the waffles. And she was like, oh, yeah. And, they, you know, there's a because a lot of times people are willing to adapt if we invite them into the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've watched that again. You know, it may be anecdotal, but my own family have sort of without a lot of resistance, like sort of come on, come on that journey in a, in a lot of ways. So I would offer that, too. And I was going to say with Bree, like, I know you have such a variety of, of, of products and just like how did you get the community to tap in and I mean like I know I saw you you start with your with your family but that, then yeah, I always yeah my, the branch out I always thought my family my close friends but to be honest my business took off from social media I started posting like what I was eating what fruits I was eating for the day, what drinks I was drinking, what smoothies I was making. And then people wanted to like buy what I was posting. So that's how my business started. You know, people were asking questions and they were curious and they were coming to me about advice because they found out about my transition. So literally it all took off just from like posting. And it's like amazing. The social media is like so amazing. It's like literally the most amazing thing. And it's like a, a great way to like spread veganism. Like completely any chance I get, I'm opening my mouth and talking about veganism because it's like it's who I am and it changed me completely. So I think once people notice like the change in me, then they seem to get more interested and want to change themselves. So I, I feel really amazing about it. So for you, what made so were you always a vegetarian or did you transition to vegetarian and then veganism? All right, so I saw a crazy <laughs> video. The video was crazy. They were like pumping the chicken with like steroids. And I used to love chicken. So I'm like, yo, this is crazy. So then I stopped chicken and then I went pescatarian. And then I watched another documentary about what they were doing to the fish. So I'm like, oh my God, you know? So it was just crazy. It was like one hit after the next. Then I started growing my own food as like a, like a social experiment with me and my mom. I wanted to see if I could like really do it. You know, let's save money. Let's do something that'll bring us closer. Let's do something that we can share with other people. So we started growing our own food. And then after that, I started traveling more. And then that's when I ran into like the hardest struggle of like veganism, like traveling while being vegan is kind of hard. Like it's really harder than you think. Most places are not like so open to it. So it's like you got to find it where you can. So that's one of the things I really ran into. But other than that, literally, it's amazing. Wow. 
So, I mean, and I, I guess like that is a good question for you. And I'm glad that you brought that up. Like, how do you travel and, and move around? Why don't laugh? I'm, I'm asking for re real question because I'm a travel agent. So I really do want to know how do y'all move around with that lifestyle? Because <laughs> I've, I've actually like started packing my own blender. <laughs> and like walking y'all laughing but I'm serious I started like that has like freeze dried the fruit and everything so all I have to do is walk with water if I'm if I'm moving around or like the protein pack powder and stuff and I don't really like whey powder so figuring that whole piece out but like what do you do if you want to maintain your lifestyle and you know that you have limited options to be honest, I always ask a, a ton of questions. Like if I'm going to a hotel, I'm asking the hotel, like what's around? Like, what do you recommend? I'm asking if the chef could veganize things, you know? You just gotta ask questions and let people know who you are so that they can know how to work with you. Most times people are willing to like meet you halfway and you're not trying to be difficult. You're just trying to eat like everybody else, you know? I'm just trying to make better choices for myself. So oh, even then, once people notice that you're trying to make better choices for yourselves, they ask you questions and then they ultimately try to like go that way too it's like really like I love eating out now like before when I first started like veganism I was like ah it's so hard to eat out people are gonna judge me like you know you don't want to be too loud you don't want to ask the waiter too many questions you don't want to do too much but now it's like a piece of cake you know it's 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 good I like the attention now <laughs> I like it now the way we do it we just went on holiday and we were like, we weren't going to get a hotel because it's harder to be a vegan in a hotel because you have to look for stuff. So we got an Airbnb, made sure we were able to hit up the grocery stores and, you know, they have all the um, cooking supplies in the, in the, in the Airbnb. So, you know, you grocery shop, you cook. Um, and it, it's a lot harder for us because we are now going more towards not eating um, at restaurants that are not fully vegan because you have to ask so many questions and sometimes they bring you things that have sprinkles of cheese on it and so it is really difficult but you know you just have to m make up in your mind you know what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and it's, it's a lot of planning <laughs> it's a lot of planning No, that's actually really helpful in just understanding, you know, how do you prep or like even prepping with, with, with children and long trips and, you know, how do you prioritize meals and meal plans? And if you all could even walk us through something like that in terms of around, around affordability and, and meal prep, because I know that's been the biggest thing for a lot of people, you know. I want to meal prep for the week or I want to, you know, make sure I have everything I need and, and save money, but also eat clean during the week. Uh, what is one thing um, or uh, different things that you all have done that work for you or that you advise people on if you want to start this lifestyle, how, how to meal prep? And I know um, that you all mentioned in terms of buying um, like veggies, every other day in order to keep them fresh. But if you want to meal prep, do you meal prep and freeze? You know, what are some options, especially yeah, I, for the busy schedule? I feel like that's, so in, in terms of travel, that before the COVIDity, I'm looking at my hotel thing that I spent 200 nights in a hotel, like the, the, the year before COVID. So a lot of my work is movement. So I, I do think that, um, so my go-to are Mediterranean food, so falafel, um, you know, there's a way in which, again, some cultures ha just have sort of built in options. Thai food and Indian food are sort of, the if I have to eat out, if I have, obviously I have to because I spend a lot of nights in hotels. Those are sort of, and they just happen to be food I really enjoy. So Indian food, Thai food, um, and Mediterranean food. And then Jamaican food, again, there are lots of options that are like rice and peas, cabbage, you know, that do not involve um, um, animals and, and meat. So those are sort of my four places that I sort of, you know, very easily can find something to eat on the menu. I, and again, I think in terms of meal prepping, and I, I think I said this before, like if for me, it is hard to talk about veganism without talking about um, or plant-based living without talking about, again, consumerism, 
right? Because a part of a lot of what we resist is that to be vegan, I think folks said it requires a preparation, requires the ability often to like prepare your own food. And there's a gendered conversation. I think women, black women transition easier than men. And certainly like cis het hetero men, like, because again, there's a way in which the world bends to the will of men in particular. And so it's like, I got to think about my food ahead of time. Like, I don't want to do that. And so people then resist anything that invites them to actually be deliberate and careful about what they eat. So I think that resistance has to be tackled. But in terms of like, you know, again, this week alone, you know, I, on Sunday, I made, I made soup, both, I, I, so tools are also important. So if you have a food processor that helps, if you have a slow cooker or an instant pot that helps, those are, and a blender. Those are three things I have in my kitchen that, and you don't have to get like high end versions. You can get simpler versions and you can cook. So again, this week I made red beans. I made rice. I made soup. I made curried lentils. And I made, so four meals, I store them, you know, and I put them in, and I made homemade hummus for snacks, you know? And so that's, again, that's my meal. And today's Thursday and, you know, Tomorrow's Friday and Saturday I'm back at it again. And, and, and this time of being home makes it easier. I do think that, you know, we'll have to make some adjustments when we start to move again. But this is also the time to experiment with so much, right? Because we are home, we are not moving. So if, if there was a time to try something, it would be now and you might find that it is not as difficult. So that's how I meal prep. So I just wanted to speak on the, um the point that um, Namaste hi, <laughs> made about the eating from um, non-vegan establishment that, you know, they get food that comes with um, dairy and, and stuff like that on their food. And I think it's very hard from, from taking it from my standpoint of um, a restaurant that does both that it has to be intentional it has to be an intent where it's not about just the dollars that you're going to get for that meal but about the 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 the, the person you're serving so like from our standpoint I can, I can speak only for my business is that we take that very very serious when we say we are doing a vegan or if we're doing um, traditional. So we have everything separate. So like we, we color code and, you know, we really go to the intent of and be intentional about what we're doing. So like waffles that we have vegan waffles, we have vegan um, our, our whipped creams or non-dairy, or um, we, if we do the mac and cheese, it's all, you know, non-dairy with um, e nutritional yeast and all those things. And we keep them separate and we label and, you know, it's, it's all intentional. And if it gets any, and if we, if anything gets out of ordinary and we're unsure, it's, it's tossed because it, it, it is, you have to, you have, you have to keep in mind that, you know, you're not just serving food. You're serving to someone's belief and to someone's it's integrity. It's all about the integrity of the business. So it speaks volume. And I, I totally understand where you're coming from because if you go to somewhere and you order something that's supposed to be plant-based, non-dairy, and you know, dairy ends up on your, your plate, it's really an insult because they're really not thinking about you as a consumer and as a, a patron for the, the 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 service, they're just thinking about the money. And right. so, and I do want to say thank you, you know, for for you to say that, especially you know about your business, for people to know that and appreciate that. That is a wonderful feeling, you know, when you go into a restaurant and you tell somebody that you're vegan and you don't want this, and they're like, "Well, what does that mean?" You know, what's that? That's the issue that I've run into. But some places, you know, they do. They have your, you know, heart when it comes to yeah. um, the food. And that is greatly appreciated. Just when you find those places that yeah. do that, that's yeah. where you tend to run away. 
we have crossed paths before at the famous food. Um, oh yeah, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know you can you you can attest to our setup it's like everything is like so separate like we and we try to put everything in green everything that's plant-based vegan anything I've seen the labels I've seen the labels <laughs> it's you know because it's not about the food that we serve for us it's the experience and it's the customer mm-hmm. and it's the integrity so, you know, I just, I just hope other businesses that would, like Dean would say, you know, transition into uh, across the board, all inclusive, because that, that's what it comes down to. Businesses should become all inclusive, inclusive of, you know, just everyone. So everyone can eat, because how about, you know, you go somewhere and then, you know, so you're with someone that wants something non-vegan and then you have a, uh, someone that's plant-based and then you both have to go different places to find something to eat mm-hmm. you know so I think it's just it's just the, the, the thought process behind it and the humanitarian behind it and also are you selling healthy healthy food or are you just selling food that's what it, I think that's what it comes down to because we not only just sell plant-based food because of people are vegan we sell food because we want people to eat nutritious nourishing taste good food (laughs) so like it encompasses like the whole spectrum not just oh this is non-dairy and this Mm -hmm. this is regular it's just it encompasses everything it's wholesome it's made from scratch it's healthy and it appeases your you know your beliefs and then the person that's not a vegetarian or a vegan, it appeases their belief, but everybody palates is feeling good. Yeah. yeah, we're definitely thankful for the vegan options, right? So I know like personally, Aaron and I, we just got tired of stalking the barista at Starbucks to make sure, right? And that's really all it is, but we're thankful for vegan options because it brings that conversation started. It allows people who are non-vegan to at least try something. And that's what it's all about because awareness brings intent, right? So it, and, and people have to be exposed to these type of things to even know that there's an option out there. Like I know, you know, I grew up drinking like coconut milk, making coconut milk. That was no big deal, but like that's new to some people. And I'm thankful that places like Starbucks, you know, places like that allow that as an option. So people can at least try it and see whether they like it or not, not just based on the name or, you know, like, obviously you and your business having that type of intention that you're serious with your labels you know we're thankful for that like because it at least brings the non-vegans who come to patronize you they see that and they're like oh man you know what let let me try it it's like and they have and they have you know i've had people that are not vegan eat the vegan food (laughs) really they have they have said oh wow no, this is really good. <laughs> and, and that, and that's like, I know you could do that. And this is really good. You know, so and 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 just to, to say that too, it's like all the research that we have done because I found myself and I told my nephew Dean, I told him that eating the non-dairy ice cream, which I didn't think that was even possible <laughs> to eat ice cream. And that is so bomb. <laughs> That's the best kind. The it's best like a dollar more sometimes, but we shouldn't be eating a lot of ice cream anyhow. So if you just a treat, you know, like it's so bomb though. It is, especially that coconut something one with the, it, oh my God. That's all I eat now. Change your life. Change your life, girl. <laughs> but I have to ask, because it's something that, um you know, you kind of all alluded to is that access. And, and even during this time, it's you all brought this to your communities and you're introducing it to people who didn't even know it existed, you know, have never tried it, have never tapped into it. And I'm wondering if more people would tap into the lifestyle, tap into this change if they had access they would definitely think so i definitely think and i know 
access is really one of the things that keeps keeps our community down because like if you were to like do a survey into some of the supermarkets that we go to and you're trying to find like say for example you guys you're trying to find you know the the food that you would like to eat nine out of ten times there's like a half a shelf with with those products like a little shelf in the corner and then everything else is just out there and there's no access. And then when you do find it, it's so pricey that you can't, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't afford it. And then in some neighborhoods, like if you have a Trader Joe in your neighborhood, okay, you, you're set because you can find Trader Joe, Whole Foods, whatever. You can find all those things that you want to eat because they, they, they cater to that. They have all the, the non-dairies, they have all the legumes, the nuts, the you know, the, the, the beans, they have all those things, but then you go to like a regular compare or regular supermarket. It's like, like my nephew said, it's mostly lettuce, tomato and, and whatever, you know, everything else is scarce. Yeah. Red I, I, oh, sorry. I'm not sure if you were. You can get some beans and stuff, but when you're looking for your, the other things that makes you, ex, when you expand and start to go into you know, the varied things that you can do to expand your, 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 your menu. It's very limited. That's from that. That's just what I've seen. Oh, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that with access. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn pre gentrification, right? So when Brooklyn was, you know, we had, you had your, you know, your Chinese restaurants, you know, you had your fast food restaurants, you know, like those weren't, um, fast supply, right? You can go down the corner and get these type of processed foods. You had your corner store. And you know, like the things they were selling in the corner store, it weren't the same types of juices and chips and stuff that they were selling in Manhattan. So access was processed foods. And you know, I remember being a child, like reading labels and wondering like, there's so many ingredients, but why does it not cost more, <laughs> right? And then you realize because of the farm subsidies and you know, basically, um, they, the government gives them so much money to produce the soy, wheat, corn, that they can mass produce all these things, but it's not whole foods, right? It's not good quality foods. We had our Asian markets in the neighborhood where we could get like our produce, but as far as you're talking about quality, you know, like first organic, but what was that, right? <laughs> there wasn't even like an option. But, and you know, now I'm thankful that there's more access to certain things. But when we're talking about like inside, inner city areas, there is no access, right? They, like they don't know what that is. And again, it goes back to exposure. If I don't know that this is an option, if mommy doesn't know this is an option, how will I know that this is even something that I should be eating because I don't have access to it. I don't know about it, I'm ignorant. And I, I'm just, you know, like I'm just surrounded by this processed food, even though I wanna do better, like, how can you do better when you don't have access to it? You don't know about it, you know? And that the food pyramid that they teach us in school, you know, like, it's topsy-turvy, right? You, you, <laughs> like, it's a joke. <laughs> that's, not, that's not food, you know? Like, that's not the quantity, you know, just joke about protein. We need so much protein, so much protein. The American diet is lacking fiber. And where do we get our fiber? In fruits and vegetables. And, like, and that's the problem. Everyone has all these irritable bowel syndrome, all this gut syndrome, and it's because they don't have access to fibrous foods and you know, and then we want to get our fiber in processed form. You want to take a spoonful of it and dump it in a drink. All you have to eat is an apple, eat the skin on it, you know, and then it, it and it speaking to eating an apple with eating the skin on it, you know, you can soak a lot of the pesticides and herbicides off of that whole fruit, right? But once it's processed and it's in there, there's nothing you can do about it, right? So it it it, it becomes harder to have access to these things because. Um, I guess kind of um, alluding to what um, Cameron was saying earlier too is in the, the policies that are like political policy, they're, they're not implement, implementing those type of changes in these neighborhoods that change, that changes the way we eat, that changes our food, you know, like they want to say that black people inherently have high blood pressure and stress and all these things like no we inherited these diets that perpetuate this um stress you know it perpetuates high blood pressure it perpetuates all these things because 
of the food we're eating. You know, I inherited this um, diet, not necessarily this type two diabetes, right? But we think we did because again, it's so close together. We don't really know how to separate it because, you know, again, I ate what my mother ate, my mother ate what her mother ate and it becomes this. And honestly, my parents ate better than I was eating because they were in Jamaica eating whole foods. You know, we came here in the, in the neighborhoods and we didn't have access to those whole foods anymore. Everything was processed and the, the provisions and the fruits and vegetables we were able to get, the quality wasn't the same, right? Because it's different than when you get it right out the earth versus being shipped, frozen, thawed. You know, like it's this whole cyclic thing that we have to appreciate when it comes to the food that we are ingesting. Yeah. And, and so often what we see, right, and how often we see something leads us to believe that um, it's good, right? So I get a, I drive off Highway 85, I turn left to come to my house, I see Burger, literally where I live, I see Burger King, I see McDonald's, I see KFC, I see um, Bojangles, I see Popeyes, I see um, like every single fast food chain you can name is on the street that leads to my house. And so if I am, if I live in this neighborhood and I internalize, there's the Food and Drug Administration, there's the government, if this is here, it must mean it's okay. And I think the, you know, it, that seems, that may seem simple to some, but so often that's what we internalize. If something is available, if something is around, what's so wrong with it, right? And if, and when people hear us talk sometimes, and I, you know, I, certainly Karen in my family, there is a way where people go, you're odd, you know, just eat what's available, you know, everybody eat, you know, just drink milk, you know, it's just, it's very like, why are you being strange? Because the stuff that we're saying, we should try to avoid is so proliferated that we then become the oddball. So for me, again, I think what plant-based living, veganism, how we choose to eat, I connect that to activism, right? So we have to talk to the grocery store managers. You know, I wrote a letter to Kroger's, like the, the Kroger's in my neighborhood, like Karen says, has one shelf. And when you go, they said, that's because people won't buy it. And I go, if you don't make it available, mm -hmm right? Like it's a two-way street, right? So yes, I may not look for it, but I didn't know anything about masks and viruses and Corona and COVIDity unless there was a big campaign to educate me. So unless Kroger's actually puts up sign that says, we have vegan options, or have you tried this non-dairy ice cream today? Unless we do that, people won't know. And so corporations, you know, grocery stores, I think we, we, we have to write to them and push them to say, you got to do more to make things more available and not just put it on the shelf and then say, look, no one bought it. You know, the, the discounts you're applying to the meat, are you also applying it to right, the vegan option? Are, are there signs? Like in my Kroger's, the vegan option is literally in the back and you got to walk around. And, you know, you, so there are ways in which I think we have to be activists, not just for ourselves, but for our broader community. I also think food education is like super important and super neglected. Like as far as like when I'm working with children, they can't tell me the difference between a kiwi and a watermelon. And I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? Or they think like, they think flavor, they think grape flavor is how grapes taste as far as candy. And I'm like, no, are you kidding me? No, this is what a real grape tastes like. So I feel like um, us as vegans, we should go lower, you know, go meet the kids where they are and teach them about things so that they can bring it back. I'm telling you, these kids are bringing back what we're telling them. And it's amazing. Y'all gotta see it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, I think you just like really tapped into something in terms of education. And I know there's a question um, that was posted in the chat, just understanding that education is a major factor and something as critical as the flavor component and understanding that the artificial flavor does not really attribute to what the real flavor of our fruits and our vegetables taste like. And something that Karen raised earlier you going into the store and if you can't understand the, the the letters and the whole alphabet that's in a ingredient it's like why do you even put it in your body and and you know i'm just curious you know for you all does reading nutrition labels really require like a level of understanding and 
is that translated to our community? Because I feel like, you know, something that you all raised earlier, Sharifa, is the products that we see in our community are not the products that we see in the other communities. We get the mass produced while everybody else gets the ones that are like farm produced which have, you know, the five ingredients versus all the chemicals in the alphabet. Yeah, and you, look, I also want to make a point about labels is like, as, like in this veganism lifestyle, right? So like, if it doesn't have that stamp of vegan on it, I become wary, even though I know like this should innately be vegan, right? I'm looking at something that's straight up, you know, like oats and, but it doesn't say vegan. So like, to be able to appreciate why something may not say that it's vegan um, and not to get too wrapped up in certain labels in that regard. Um, and another thing is, you know, that whole term of natural flavor, that can be the reason because natural flavoring, like, you know, kind of what um, Karen alluded to, that, that you know, that, that governmental input sometimes, that FDA <laughs> that we trust so much, you know, like, it, 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 this whole thing is trending, right? And it's becoming like big money. So like it's, and you know, when money, when money gets involved, the integrity becomes compromised. So, you know, like we, I'm a, I read labels and I listen, everything, right? I'm looking at the back of it, but I also try not to be as cynical and wary of like certain things because like, it, it, you know, it is, it is tough. <laughs> it is tough to like walk that line of, like, I, I know this apple is vegan, right? Like, that's just straight up. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It doesn't need a label. But, you know, like, when it now becomes processed in any form, it, apple juice, right? And they say natural flavors. I know that natural flavors can come from an animal, right? I know that, you know, like, so it's, it's not just reading the label in the supermarket. It's doing your research before you get into the supermarket to understand why things are labeled the way they are, you know, because lobbying is a big part of that. You know, um, like 10 years ago, there were only like five things that can be introduced into an, an ingredient that can be organic, right? Inorganic things that can be introduced into um, any processed thing that can still be considered organic. Now that's up to 100 things, or probably over 100 things, inorganic things that can be introduced into um, a label because of lobbying, right? Because it's big money and because it's all about making money. So, but I'm saying that to say like, it's it's a weird space to be in because a label doesn't mean that it's, you know, like you got to kind of know why is it being labeled that way? You know, like the things that they are able to sell in America aren't allowed in Europe. That's my, you know, that's a big, big issue. You know, like GMOs and things like that. It's because, you know, America is about consumerism. So they want you to buy, buy, buy. And um, other places, not so much, you know? So labels are good. We should read labels, but we should do the educational part before we start reading labels to understand why is it labeled that way? And because it's labeled, the verbiage that they're using, what are they allowed to encompass underneath that verbiage? You know, like it, because it's organic or non-GMO verified and things like that, like, does it have to go through quality assurance in order to get that label? Or, you know, like, it's just this whole process of educating yourself before you get into the store. So when you do get into the store, you're truly um, an aware consumer, not just because you read the label, you know, like, so it's, you know, it's, it's a weird space to be in, but it, it just takes work, you know, it takes a lot of work before you get into the store to read the label, actually. I feel like sometimes it's like you, you have to print out that that sheet with you. It's like a cheat sheet and walk with it down the aisles and start comparing. It's like, is this the symbol? Is this not the symbol? You know, is this the one that's passed inspection? Is this level okay? Is it not okay? But it, as much as it's work on your end, it might be a matter of life or death for you. And I feel like we have to go that extra step sometimes to, to protect ourselves, to protect our family. Um, Cause even, thinking about like the different colors and the different color dyes, I didn't even know people could be allergic to those. And I found that out, you know, the hard way with my family members with all the colors and the different color dyes that they put in, you know, candy, kids candy. That's what we found out like red dye number 45 or whatever it is, 
family members are allergic to it because it's not made from a fruit or it's not made from a vegetable. It's not natural dyeing. It's all artificially created. And you've got to do your due diligence. You have to do your research before you get into the grocery store because you're picking up stuff blindly and not realize what you're putting into your body. Um, somebody else asked in the chat, how should one uh, go about starting this vegan lifestyle? You know, can they talk to someone about it? You know, is it going into a restaurant, trying a meal and, and really kind of figuring out what their palate is when they take that first step? I would say that, you know, educating yourself, just, you know, stepping out of your bubble and deciding that, hey, I'm going to try this or, hey, I'm going to learn about this. And once you do, and you know what you feel you believe is, is true, then it's a mindset thing. You have to change your mindset and say like, hey, you know, if I wanna become vegan, I'm gonna be vegan. If I wanna be vegetarian, if I'm gonna stop eating meat, if I'm gonna do this, it all starts up here first. You know, make the decision on what you wanna do and stick with it. You could be like Brie and scare yourself straight by watching some documentaries <laughs> too, right? Cause that's how we started. When you watch some documentaries, you're like, oh. I was I'm like, wait, home. wait. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to cry. You guys should have saw me. But I also think um, you should know your why. Knowing your why gives you a purpose and then it um, gives you direction, you know. It holds you accountable. Because I know, like, my why is, is bigger than me, you know. I have so many people, like, watching me, so many people, like, observing what I'm doing. I have so much to live for, you know. Longevity is ultimately the key. So knowing your why, it really takes you as far as you can go, so... Oh, and start with Meatless Monday. That's a good alternative. Start with Meatless Monday. I like that. So you take those baby steps and kind of ease, ease your way in. Try a different Meatless Monday every Monday. Try a different meal. Um, definitely a good idea. Uh, the other thing I have for you, and I think some of you kind of mentioned it in and out, is, is this a trend, you know? And a lot of people are, are getting into the lifestyle because they're like, oh, this person's doing it, Lizzo's doing it, Beyonce's doing it. But is this a trend or is this really a lifestyle that people really need to consider, not only for you know health purposes, but also to benefit our community and our our, our entire world? And I think, you know, Karen, you started looking at it as well in terms of understanding what we're doing to our livestock, understanding what we're doing to um, the world as a whole in terms of really understanding if we start tapping into a vegan lifestyle, vegetarian lifestyle, what it could mean for us working in terms with the, the, the earth. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that I care if it's a trend or you know, like I think on some levels, how people arrive um, at these shores, I'm not sure that it matters, right? Like all of us <clears throat> in any journey that we're on, if we go back to the first day of doing something, or perhaps some people are better than me, but a lot of what I do now, I didn't, my first day I was an all in. It was experimental, it was, it was intrigue, it was curiosity, and I think as, as, as human beings, our species, we, we gravitate towards things that make our lives better. And so I do think that someone said Meatless Mondays, even if that's a trend, I think people will find, you know, through my own journey, I've, I've really come to love cooking and that's like a legitimate hobby now. Like, you know, three years ago, if you said, what's your hobby? I'd be like, I don't know. But now I'm like cooking, you know, and creating and experiments. And so I think people will discover things about themselves that I think will be transformative. And so where we start isn't necessarily the conversations I'm not wrapped up in. It may be a trend and it, it may be popular right now, but that's also good because um, namaste, you know, when you talk about your children, there's a way in which there's a beauty, the world that they will inherit is a world where when we talk about plant-based and different types of living eating, 
the journey that we're on to discover and to ask certain kinds of questions, the world they inherit is going to be much more open because it is something that is being popularized. So I'm, you know, I have a friend who was vegan 30 years ago and he was like, all we had back then, <laughs> you know? So he's like a little bit jealous because he's like, yeah, y'all new vegans, you know, y'all got all kinds of stuff. All, all we had <laughs> 20 years ago <laughs> was lettuce, right? So I'm, I'm here for it being popular. I'm here for celebrities joining. I'm here for Meatless Mondays because that doesn't dictate where we end because transformation is transformation. I love it. Transformation is transformation, however you get there. Yeah. So, oh, uh, go ahead, continue. Oh, so um, as far as it being a trend, I think, I think it can be a trend for some people, like as far as like celebrities. I also think celebrities do it for like strictly for benefits. Like I know Beyonce goes vegan, like for her body for like a couple months out of the year. I know Lizzo probably does the same thing, you know, but I feel like they're using their platform for the right reasons and they're spreading awareness that we need in veganism. So I'm all for it, you know, I mean, that may not be my why, you know, it's not a trend for me, but I'm all for it. Bring the people. Well, I love it. Definitely bring people and however they get there, as long as they're learning and, and transitioning themselves to a healthier lifestyle, I'm all for it. Um, and speaking of that, we had someone who asked in the chat that says Johnson's place, but it, the person's name is Karen. So they're asking you all, what is your favorite vegan meal? I see the wheel spinning. <laughs> so I love me a good black bean taco. I love me a good black bean taco with some avocado, some onions, some lettuce, tomato, you know, hook it up however you like it. Do it on Tuesdays so nobody makes fun of you for not having taco Tuesdays. <laughs> I mean, everything. Do I have to pick one thing? Like, listen. You can give me a menu. I mean, I'm, I'm good with a menu. That works too. What did you have today? We had, what did you cook today? Oh, I cooked Impossible Helper. So it was like, you know, Hamburger Helper. And it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. I mean, I mean, and then um, Karen was talking and we're listening to him like, was he in our kitchen this exactly, week? Exactly, because we had, we had the tuna, tuna the carrot from, dogs. <laughs> but you made the tuna from, not the chickpeas. Hearts of Palm. Um, yeah. Nice. Um, I made hummus. Um, this week, I'm telling you, brother, this what? you were hitting what everything this make? entire week. Oh, pasta. Oh, my goodness. The, the, I didn't make it with the, like the vegan feta. I made, um, you know, I put a little bit of olive oil in the pan, garlic, tomatoes, nice. um, with some vegan pesto, found it in the store, um, put a little butter in it. Come on. Mushrooms, whipped it brown, and yeah. <laughs> little, some garlic bread in the oven. Yeah. That was gone too. Yeah. I, um, I, I made red beans and rice too. Right. I, I'm talking about everything, everything you said. You were like, wow. I don't know if you know the face. I'm like, great. Like everything. <laughs> like he was like, right. We're, listen, we're, we're connected, right? We got yeah, this connection yeah, yeah. and that's beautiful because you were hitting everything that we were actually, that we had within this week. But yeah. the kids, they always want tenderoni. So the, our mac and cheese goes with everything um mashed potatoes i make salisbury steak vegan you know of course um mm -hmm. you can't live without a taco no matter how it comes <laughs> okay <laughs> taco uh nachos anything you can get uh, breakfast burritos uh, um potatoes and onions <laughs> potatoes and onions uh, with the oh uh, the just egg um yeah you know i tried that the just eggs isn't yeah i was like oh this is good for the first time like two weeks ago the garden breakfast sausage i throw that in there if i don't have time um to make it look full on a plate i'll throw it in a burrito wrap and you know fry it kind of like fry the outside of it yeah. send it on out the kitchen it's all <laughs> in the reed house please <laughs> believe it we are eating <laughs> Yeah. One of my one of my favorite things is I love all of those things actually, um, but I I like this because my mom and I both enjoyed and we've gotten 
we like we we talk now we like share recipes which i really enjoy that actually um but we make this zucchini fritter so you grate the zucchini you let it you put a little salt to get a lot of the water out and then you squeeze it out you so you get the water you add these cloth yeah you know yeah i didn't want to sound you know yes you you need that too you really do need a cheesecloth if you're gonna do this um um plant-based stuff and i um and then you add you, you onion i do jalapenos i do um nutritional yeast a little bit of flour and you you season it and you make these patties and you fry them and they and are eat them. <laughs> they're very good that, so that's like my and you can do you can make those as sandwiches regrettably i can't eat avocado i love avocado but i literally throw up every time i eat it so it right. would that would be good with like avocado but i i make that as burgers sometimes or sometimes i just eat it you know as a snack yeah i made some um king oyster mushroom bacon those, those yeah king oyster mushroom Put it Fried. On. Look at your face. <laughs> yeah, fried mushroom and gravy is really good. You know? Oh, yes, definitely. Also, fried cauliflower. Tap into yeah. that. It's a good yeah, one. Definitely. Yeah. Listen, you got to put it in the oven, though, to get it softer. Because <laughs> that cauliflower taste is real strong. <laughs> definitely strong. But if you like it, you love it. I love it, yeah. Oh, I do want to throw something in there. Like, when you do the jackfruit, if you want to put it in anything, I would boil it first for at least like 45 minutes to an hour to pull some of that sweet flavor out of it. And then you can, once you drain it and try, kind of squeeze it, it'll, you can put any type of seasoning on top of it because it, sometimes it has that fruity flavor to it and you don't want that. But if you boil it first, it won't. I'm trying that. I'm trying that. Cause I do the jackfruit and yeah, there's a, there's a leftover of like, oh, I don't really want that flavor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. The chat's going in. They want recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all making people hungry right now. <laughs> Come on. And man. I appreciate it. it everybody, threw all grandma, everybody threw all grandma out the window. She said that John sound good. <laughs> But I'm like, I, I appreciate the honesty because I, I, I felt it because I saw y'all speaking with your eyes and your soul. The recipes were speaking life and, and that, that black bean taco. The same way you, you would cook any other food that you would make before, just cook it the same way, mm -hmm. you know, throw the same seasoning on it and just try it and make sure you're, you know, get a little taste of it before you, you know, put too much salt on it or anything. And it'll be on your plate. I promise you, you can turn anything vegan. Well, I'm excited for this. Um, I saw one person had, um, had asked about uh, lactose free options if you're vegan, but I'm assuming that pretty much everything would be lactose free. I, I use the Chobani oat milk, which is Okay. really really good and you can you can make your own oat milk and I know that sounds it's not really complicated at all because it's really just oats um but if you don't do that the Chobani oat milk is very good it's good in terms of coffee it's good with cereal it's I, that's the one I use I like oat milk over like we almond. switched to we were doing almond breeze I think that's what we were using and we switched to the organic um almond milk that they have at Whole Foods even the kids said it tastes better, so. Yeah. And I like well, hemp. So hemp oh, you said you, uh, which milk? milk? Hemp. Oh, okay. Yeah, pretty good. Well, last but not least, before we wrap up, um, please tell everyone where they can find you on social media. Okay. <laughs> so I'll start. Um, you can find us on Instagram as the waffle chick. Waffle the the waffle chick. We're there, big bright pink. And also <laughs> check us out with our vegan options. We're expanding, we're learning, we're growing, and it's all intentional. And it's all coming from eating inside the box. There you go. 
when I have a grown Instagram for my cooking, it's called Karan Loves Cooking. Yeah. <laughs> follow me. And I post uh, recipes, some recipes, but more of people tasting food and they're like, oh my God. <laughs> so to, to the point of you can veganize a lot of things. So I, I do that. <laughs> Definitely. You guys can find me on Instagram. I am Bree the Fruit Dealer. Um, I'm on Facebook too, but uh, for business things, check out Instagram. I drop everything that I'm doing, all events, um, new menus, sale dates. So everything you can imagine is all on Instagram. You can find me there at Bree the Fruit Dealer. Um, yeah, so we changed our name on there so you can see Namaste underscore vegan. Um, send us a message. We have um, some of our menus posted. Um, we'll be doing pop-ups soon. Um, we do deliveries in Suffolk County, you know, in our area. But if you have any questions, you want to know something, you just want to stop by, say hi, um, come on through. Yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. Well, it has truly been a pleasure having you all and just hearing your journey and hearing your truth and why you all kind of stepped into this lifestyle and transitioned to this lifestyle and how you are bringing so many people with you all. <laughs> I see the chat. People said, I'm hungry now, which is good. We want y'all to leave hungry. We want you all to leave um, feeling fulfilled and feeling educated about you know, how you all can make conscious decisions for yourselves, your loved ones, and truly start making this transition to possibly becoming vegan. And even if you do it just for a day and start slowly making those conscious steps to a better you, this is why we provided this platform for you all. And I am so honored to have each and every one of you here with us this evening. It has been a pleasure. Y'all have been amazing. <laughs> and I feel like I'm amongst family and friends. And I just want to thank you all for an amazing conversation that was real honest and open. I feel like I, I dive back to my roots a little. My Jamaican posse, my, my Bayesian posse, my West Indian posse, y'all was lit and I appreciate it. On behalf of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Omega Eta Zeta Chapter, all of our sorority sisters, our Z Hope Committee that is on, thank you so much to the text team. Yes, I see somebody asking about vegan oxtails. I'm a prayer for you. But thank you so much for the text team. <laughs> thank you so much to all of our stores that are present. Thank you for they all of the members. The I know they do. I am still, that is not of God. <laughs> Thank you all for everyone that tapped in. That is there. Our sister greets, uh, co-workers, friends, family, everybody on Facebook Live. Y'all have been amazing audience asking great questions, plugging in and sharing this content. So we look forward to seeing you all. Um, for those of you that we have an informational next week for learning more about Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Omega Eta Zeta Chapter, more about what we do in this community. Have a great night. Stay safe. If it is cold where you are and snowing, I feel your pain. We got snow outside. Get a blanket, warm up, wear your mask, do what you got to do. And don't forget that vitamin C and tap in to get some veganism in your lifestyle. It'll probably upgrade your system as well. Good night. Love y'all and be blessed. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs> Thank you.